Hello, and welcome to ChipReport.tv. This is the show for the week of July 29th, 2012. This is our second installation of ChipReport.tv. ChipReport is a weekly online series about the newest chips available in the industry. Hopefully it's helpful for all you hobbyists, professionals without much time, and students who are just trying to learn about chips. Check out the new chips, and then start dreaming. This week, we're going to call it the Summer of Sensors because, well, you'll see. Up first is the Vichet VSOP 98260. You know that universal remote you have that you bought for $5 from the grocery store or from your convenience store? Well, all of those have IR sensors in them. Really, they have IR LEDs, which work as detectors. And behind that, they have a bunch of circuitry. But now, you don't need any of that. The Vichet chip actually is everything behind that, kind of like an analog front end like we talked about last week. Really, it's a preamp and a, t a trans impedance amplifier. You'll sometimes see that annotated as a TIA. In reality, what this is going to do, it's going to help shape and amplify signals. And that can be really important for LEDs. A lot of infrared LEDs aren't very optimized for the infrared range, which is, sounds ridiculous. But it's true, not all of them can really amplify or detect infrared signals as well as they should yet, but they're working on it. Anyways, this chip will help you shape those signals so that you really understand how the signals are coming to you in terms of from the transmitter or from other devices. At first I was calling this a VASIC, or a Very Application Specific IC, V-A-S-I-C. Now, not so much. I, at first I thought it had all the DSP in it, but really it's more of a preamp. The input is AC coupled, and like I said before, it's a trans impedance amplifier, so it's detecting really low currents. It's sensitive from 20 to 60 kilohertz, which helps make it immune to fluorescent lamps. A lot of fluorescent lamps, especially with the rise of CFLs, can really throw a lot of weird frequencies into your detection, and that can mess up your, you know, if you're trying to create an, a remote or a detector. Now all you need is a simple LED in the IR range or a pin diode. The chip itself takes 2 to 3.6 volts and it can run off the same rail as the IR LED. And it only takes 1 milliamp of supply current. Again, tiny package, 2.2x2 2 2 QFN, and they're playing a pretty mature market. If you buy a thousand or more of these, you're going to pay 20 cents a piece. My opinion, I think it could be cool to design it into a lot of different things. It could really help you to add functionality, whereas you didn't think it was possible before. So either as, uh, you know, to have a receiver on your micro, just throw a IR LED down, one of these chips, and you're good to go. Next up in our summer of sensors, and in this case, output devices, is the DRV8837 from Texas Instruments. It's a low voltage H-bridge controller IC. The output can goes out, go up to 1.8 amps, and on the input, it goes from 1.8 volts all the way up to 11 volts, which makes it good for lithium ion battery packs or different configurations of smaller battery packs. The output and the application is meant for brushed DC motors, but not just brushed DC motors. The chip itself has RDS on in terms of the MOSFETs internal that are 280 milliohms, so it really helps save on power and heat. And in terms of heat, it's a 2x2 QFN package with a thermal pad, so any heat you do have can get sucked away down into the ground plane. It's got a couple different easy sleep modes, and in sleep mode it only takes 35 nanoamps of quiescent current. The actual chip itself, it all runs off an internal charge pump. Whereas sometimes this causes concern about noise, for DC, brushed DC motors, it's really not going to be a problem. And the fact that you get to work off 1.8 volt rails makes it pretty spectacular. The output is an H-Bridge out output, so it actually is a lot more general than just brushed DC motors. You can drive single turns of a stepper motor, or directly drive a solenoid. It's not necessarily in vogue right now, a lot of the quadcopters are all brushless DC, but this thing is actually quite versatile. And for the price, you really can't beat it. 45 cents in thousand quantities, so even if you have to throw a couple at your motors, you can probably afford it. It's not quite as specialized as a stepper motor application-specific IC, like the Allegro A4982, 
My buddy Dave Jones actually reviewed that in the MakerBot replicator video. But it actually can, this, this chip can actually fit a lot of different needs, especially low cost needs. So check it out. Next up from ST Micro is the LSM330, part of the iNemo family. This is a six axis inertial monitor. What that really means is it's a three axis accelerometer and a three axis gy gyroscope. In terms of the inputs, it runs off a 2.4 volt to 3.3 volt rail. The digital IO runs off a 1.8 volt rail. And if you want to talk to it over digital lines, it takes I squared C and spy communication. When you're actually accessing the chip, it's actually a simple register readback. So if you have an FPGA or a micro, it's pretty easy to just read back values as it gets stored in the register. It has an onboard temperature sensor in case your readings are actually sensitive to temperature. And in terms of the different types of accelerometer settings, there's a 2, 4, 6, 8, and 16G selectable setting. So your sensitivity can vary depending on your needs. Say you're in a very sensitive situation where you want to track position, you might want a higher sensitivity. In terms of the gyroscope, it has a 200, 500, and 2000 DPS setting. And the really cool thing about this chip, and what I'm most excited about, is the programmable gesture recognition. You can have two different state machines, so that if you want to program in a common action that your users are doing, say, up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, A, B, A, B, start, uh, maybe you could program that in. Otherwise, maybe you just want to show that the user can shake it around or has some kind of specific motion that you're used to that you know that the user is going to use. You can program into the state machine and then trigger an action based on that without any processor intervention. Last up is the Silicon Labs SI477X AM-FM receiver. What? <laughs> AM-FM receiver? Sounds a little old school, doesn't it? Well, maybe, but now it's actually all on the exact same piece of silicon. And actually there's different circuits for the AM receiver and the FM receiver. It also has symbol decoding, block synchronization, error detection, and error correction functions, because this chip's meant for high-end audio. It also has an onboard DSP to actually do all the different processing of the incoming streams, including the RF. There's also bandwidth feedback for actually decoding the signal coming in so to help tune into the different signals. The output of this thing is actually a left and a right channel, so with an amplifier, you can directly drive some speakers. There's integrated volume control so that as soon as you receive those signals, you can scale them up and down to play them for your users. You actually don't need to do any intermediate frequency or IF decoding in terms of the HD stream that this thing is possible to receive. It does an I squared C output. So if you see the commercial radio these days that have songs that are playing on the radio and all the different encoded information, now you can receive that with an I squared C output without any other hassle. The fully integrated voltage controlled oscillator and the phase lock loop really help for accurate tuning of the FM stations. The package itself is a 6x6 QFN, so you're actually not going to take up that much board space, and you can throw this into any of your projects. It's $5.26 for 10k quantities, and if you want the HD version, which is the 4777, it's $6.31. That means you can receive HD radio with it. Internal to the chip, you can actually use the FM channel equalizer to help kill multipath. So if you're going through high traffic areas with lots of different stations, you're not going to see a lot of problems. Or if you're going through a mountainous region where those signals are bouncing all over the place, this chip will actually take care of it. With this chip, I really like to imagine telling an engineer about it 30 years ago, time travel or whatever. I'd basically tell him, hey buddy, pack it in. <laughs> AM, FM radios that you're designing right now, they're all on chip now. They're totally integrated. Of course, these days, the tough part, who listens to radio anymore? That's all for chipreport.tv this week. The summer of sensors might be over, but really the best part starts now. You can start using these chips to grab real, real world data and start shoving it into your projects. You never know when you might need to control something with a remote, or how fast a product's falling, or even receiving radio broadcasts. Or taking all that data, doing a little processing on it, and then driving a motor with it. All of today's chips and their data sheets can be found on chipreport.tv, the website. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up on YouTube. 
And since we're so new to the video scene, be sure to subscribe to YouTube so you hear about our newest videos. If you tell your friends, we'd really appreciate it. We're trying to grow fast so that everybody can hear about the newest chips as fast as possible. Until next time, get designing with those new chips.